This is the IU Northwest Community Garden Session, Composting from a Permaculture Perspective, presented by Christine Maloney. Christine Maloney has been practicing various permaculture principles and techniques like composting for nearly two decades. But it wasn't until she took her first permaculture design course in 2016 that she found her tribe, the people with whom she connected because of their passion for the environment, humanity, and developing a sustainable and regenerative future. She took the Advanced Permaculture Designer and Educator courses through the Permaculture Institute of North America and has been hosting workshops to share knowledge and connect people who are interested in restoring balanced agricultural and social practices by mimicking nature's harmonious systems. Welcome, Christine. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. So if we could see the next slide, please. All right, so I am an advanced permaculture designer and educator. I've taken three courses for my certification. I do have some other certifications that, um, like the Master Naturalist, Master Recycler, um, Morel Mushroom ID, and Hoosier River Watch. Um, I have been an educator for about 18 years now. Um, started off as a homeschool educator, homeschooled my four kids. Then I moved into teaching art at the public schools at an after school class and have done environmental education with my current employer, Shirley Hines Land Trust, and um, work with a lot of people right now to teach them about the environment uh, because that's one of my passions. Um, so my passions being wild edibles and medicinals, um, organic gardening, which my garden right now is flush with seedlings and makes me super happy. Oh, hold on, slow down. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I am a huge compost fanatic. I have been doing this for nearly two decades in various forms and using various systems. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, some people do consider me a bit of a borderline lunatic about composting because if I go out to a restaurant uh, after we're done eating, I'm always asking everybody for their napkins, for their scrap foods to put into the composting. And to date, I have composted over 14,000 pounds of food and paper waste. And that is, next slide please. Um, from these various places that either I've worked, my kids have worked, or organizations that I've worked with. Um, so these are just uh, some of the, the places that I've coordinated with or consulted for. So we'll start off by talking about what permaculture is. Uh, I know in the poll many of you mentioned that you've heard of it before. Um, Taking a permaculture design course, which is shortened to PDC, is a 72-hour course. And you go through many different aspects of what permaculture is. Um, and it is fairly all-encompassing. It covers uh, um, everything from green technology to agriculture to culture to um, building design tools and technology. Um, there are many different aspects of it. Um, if we could go to the next slide. The word permaculture itself is a blending of the two words permanent and culture. Now originally it was agriculture, but we know that we need to take these ideas much larger than to just agriculture. So um, many people in the permaculture uh, mindset understand that we are working towards permanent culture. And permanent means enduring. Culture is anything that's related to um, the continuation of human society. So everything that we do is our culture. So permaculture is the blending of those two words. So when I have to give a very brief description about what permaculture is, this is my elevator speech. Um, it's a holistic design system. And so holistic means that it covers the entirety of something. So if you go to a holistic practitioner or a holistic doctor, they are treating you mind, body, and spirit. And permaculture is holistic in, in that same concept. Design means that we're actively creating it and installing it um, in a system means that everything is working together harmoniously. Next slide, please. Now this holistic design system, permaculture, is meant to regenerate our communities and the earth. Um, we can't have one without the other. We depend on the earth, although the earth doesn't really need us around. <laughs> we do need the earth and we need to be able to, um, to work together harmoniously to, to be able to continue our existence. So that is one of the main goals of permaculture is to regenerate our communities and earth. Next slide, please. And we do also want to provide resiliency during times of upheaval. 
and we've been experiencing a lot of upheaval this year. Um, just everything from the wildfires in Australia that started off 2020 and then COVID and, and um, now the, the social injustices that are being brought again to the forefront of uh, social media. Um, these are times of upheaval, whether it's social upheaval, environmental upheaval, economic upheaval, or even personal upheaval. Providing resiliency gives us that buoyancy to be able to ride out difficult times. And that's what permaculture does for us. Next slide, please. We do this by imitating and observing the patterns in nature. So we look to nature as our guide, our muse, and see what sort of patterns are working in nature and then applying them to our social systems and the way that we work with nature to generate the food and um, safe housing that we need for each other and for our families. Next slide, please. And most importantly, it needs to be for the benefit of all. We cannot have one organism, whether it's the human race, we can't have one subspecies of the race benefiting more than others. This needs to be for the benefit of all. So when we look at this, my elevator speech in entirety, it's a holistic design system that helps to regenerate our communities and earth by providing resiliency during times of upheaval, by observing and imitating patterns in nature for the benefit of all. So this is the foundation that the rest of our workshop today will be coming from and provide a, a guiding pathway for us. Next slide, please. So permaculture is based on three ethics. It's based on um, the ethics of earth care, people care, and future care. So earth care, like the icon shows, is about taking care of everything in the physical realm, the plants, the soil, the water, the air, everything that's around us that physically supports us, the earth. People care. It's about taking care of ourselves. So practicing self-care, you know, we, we, we need to make sure we have something in our cup before we uh, give to others. So self-care is important. Um, taking care of our kin, and whether that is taking care of the kin that we are biologically related to, or the kindred spirits that we draw into our lives that enrich us. And like um, uh, Leslie mentioned earlier, when I took my permaculture design course and I found my tribe, that's my kin. Those are the people that I share that common desire to um, enrich life with. So we take care of ourselves, we take care of our kin, we take care of our larger communities. So whether that's the people that live around you, um, if it's your larger community of your city, whether it's the state of Indiana or even the, the, the world in its entirety, um, we take care of the people. Um, and many permaculturists will even extend this to our furry friends and our feathered friends and the creepy crawlies um, because we all have life in us. So uh, people care is about not just the two-leggeds, but the four-leggeds, the winged, the six-leggeds, the creepy crawlies, all of that. And future care, um, this ethic also used to be called fair share. So if you look at the icon in the graphic, it's a pie. And there's a piece of the pie taken out of it and it's you know in front of you it's like it's being offered so future or fair share which is what this future care used to be called was about sharing resources evenly and equally and redistributing the abundance so if i have a garden full of tomatoes and i'm not going to use them all sharing that abundance with others to enrich their lives and i think one of the things that i love about this icon is because it's really nice to have a piece of pie but I don't need to eat the whole thing, right? We don't need the whole pie. We don't need to be greedy. We need to be sharing. Um, and future care also is about transition, transition away from the global economy, transition towards our local economies, towards our, our um, local communities as well. So that's what future care refers to. So these are our three ethics, the core of what uh, guides us and uh, provides inspiration and answers for every question that we have. So if we ask a question, 
How does it fit into earth care? How does it fit into people care? How does it fit into future care? These will guide us um, just like the, the Native American ideas of the seven generations. We have to think about how our decisions are impacting the earth, the people, and our future. So next slide, please. So when we think about composting, then that's the whole point of our workshop today is how does composting fit into permaculture and how can we implement this in our lives in a balanced way? So when we think about composting in relation to earth care, that seems pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, we are taking a resource, a waste resource, whether it's the scraps from your dinner table or the long clippings from your yard or the leaves that have fallen around your house or um, you know, whatever waste products that you would normally put into your garbage that would then end up in a landfill, we are treating the earth with respect by keeping those resources out of the landfill and keeping it in our yards, by returning those nutrients back into that cycle of life instead of throwing them away. You know, we humans, we are the only creature that creates waste. No other creature on the face of the earth takes their garbage and puts it into a closed container where it's no longer usable for any other creature. So we really need to rethink our our um, the way we consider waste and um, our you know the, the products that we cr uh, create but no longer need. So earth care it, uh, composting fits into earth care because we are returning nutrients back to the soil. By doing this, this fits into people care. So if you're gardening, whether you've got a windowsill garden in your apartment or you've got a garden in your backyard or you've got a huge farm. This fits into people care because when we're returning those nutrients back to the soil, those so that enriches the soil and then that enriches us. We are then eating those nutrients and we're eating more nutrient dense food, which then uh, allows our bodies to heal better and faster. It gives us more mental clarity. Um, we get a lot more of the trace minerals that conventional farming has removed from the soil. And composting fits into future care because, like I had mentioned with the landfill, we are saving those nutrients. We are enriching our soil for future generations. We're also limiting or reducing the amount that needs to be hauled to a landfill. And when we think about the resources of the garbage truck that needs to take those resources, um, the petroleum that is required to haul that to the landfill, um, if we can reduce our dependence on big oil, we are caring for the future because all of these are interconnected. So compost in and of itself is two things. It's the process of taking your food and paper waste. So it's a process, it's a verb, it's something that we do. And then it's also the product. It's the finished product of you know, what we can hold in our hands and then amend our soil with. So it's these two things um, that we use this word for. Um, and a lot of times when I'm working with a restaurant, I will tell the manager or whoever, I'm like, I'm going to come and pick up your compost. Well, I'm technically not picking up their compost. I am picking up their food and paper waste that I will compost in my yard and then turn into compost. So um, I like to make that distinction. Um, it tickles my fancy to think about the fact that it's a, a multi-purpose word. When we take this finished product of compost and add it to the soil, what we're really doing is we're enriching the soil food web. And this concept was developed in the 1980s by Dr. Elaine Ingham. And you can check out her website at soilfoodweb.com. And she offers all sorts of really great detailed classes about how we can um, look at the microbes in the soil and see exactly how they're enriching the soil. But on a very basic level, when we take the compost from our compost piles and turn it back into our gardens or even just spread it on the yards, that's not going directly into the plants. What it's doing is it's feeding the organisms and the fungi in the soil. So plants do photosynthesis. They, they spread their leaves out, they absorb the sunlight, they turn that sunlight into glucose. That glucose gets sucked back down the stems of the plant, gets put into the soil, and then that glucose 
glucose then feeds the nematodes and the fungi and the other organisms in the soil. In return, the fungi and the organisms push nutrients from the soil back into the plants and they have this um, reciprocal relationship. So the plants really need the fungi and the microbes in the soil and most of our conventional farming has killed all of them. They've used herbicides and fungicides and insecticides um, and any other side you can think of, and they have killed the microbes in the soil. So conventional farming in that soil is functionally dead, which is why they have to add nutrients like phosphorus, potassium, and NPK. Sorry, drawing a blank on the other one. <laughs> but those three main, um, those three main nutrients are what they use to grow our, our corn and our soybeans. Um, but what we can do on, on our level, and this can even be done on a large scale, I'm gonna show you pictures in a little bit, but what we're really doing is we are reintroducing microbes into the soil. I mean, microbes are everywhere. They're in the air that we breathe, they're on our skin, um, they're in, on, when you, know, when you take a lasagna out of the refrigerator and it's got really pretty colored fungus on it, those are the things that are helping to turn food back into um, humus or soil. So, um, you know, all of these things are related and uh, turning these, uh, our, our food and paper waste into compost enriches the soil, thereby enriching us. So the soil food web, I, I could talk about this for hours. I love talking about uh, fungus and, and microbes and the interconnectedness of life. Um, but that's what we're really doing is we're enriching the soil, we're removing a waste product from the waste stream, and we're thereby enriching our own bodies with nutrients from the plants that are then healthier. So if we can go to the next slide, I want you to see two farm fields side by side. And um, Dr. Elaine Ingham um, in her classes teaches farmers how to take compost and make a tea out of it. Now it's not a tea that we would drink, um, it's a tea that gets sprayed out onto the farm fields. And so if you look at this image, on the left-hand side is a farm field that has been sprayed with compost tea. So there's a lot of bi biology in the light. There's a lot of microbes, there's fungi in there. It's healthy soil. And the farm field to the left of it has not been sprayed with compost tea. It's a traditional farm field. Um, you know, both of them look like they're fallow, but you can see that the one that has the compost on it is so much richer. The plants are alive because they're able to use their photosynthesis to feed the microbes and the fungi, which then feeds them in return and then continues that cycle of healthy life. So the next slide also shows another image of a very degraded hillside area. And on the left-hand side, again, you can see the degraded, eroded landscape um, there's that one bush in the foreground. That's the only thing that's alive there. A couple of trees in the background. But once compost is added back to the soil, once those microbes and fungi are given a chance to reestablish and to work with the plants, they will rehabilitate the soil. Um, so if we go to the next slide, this next one is even more astounding. This is the Los Plateau in China. And over the decades of um, constant animal grazing and farming on the left hand side or the right hand side you can see the Los Plateau before any restoration was done on it and it was arid it was dry the soil was depleted uh, erosion was horrific once they started instituting uh, permaculture, permaculture principles and started re-enriching the soil with compost life returns. That's what we want to do. We want to regenerate our communities and the earth. Remember my uh, definition of permaculture is to regenerate our communities and our earth. So once we regenerate the earth, then our communities can be regenerated as well. My good friend Frankie, aka Franklin Delano Roosevelt, <laughs> um, had this quote here. It says, a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. And we can see that happening in society. We can see that we humans are not healthy anymore. The amount of disease and illness we have um, is very closely related to the amount of nutrients we're getting from our own food. And I remember reading a study about prison inmates 
And when prison inmates, and this is a little skewed, but when they were receiving a vitamin supplement, the number of violent acts decreased. And we know that when people start eating healthier, they're calmer, they are less agitated, um, are, we're more likely to heal faster. So in destroying our soils with conventional agriculture, we have really been destroying ourselves. And that's why it's so important to take this one step. This is just one step in the many things that we can do to enrich our communities, to enrich our, our own health, but to also enrich the soil is to, you know, just start something simple like composting in your backyard. So there are several different types of composting systems. Um, we'll start with a small scale one, we'll work up to a large scale. Um, and I really wish we were in person and we could talk more about what types of composting you're doing or have tried in the past, because I think it's so fascinating to see how people are able to fit composting into their lives, whether they're in an apartment, whether they're in a home, whether they're doing it large scale. There's a really great book called um, Community Scale Composting Systems. And it talks about various types of composting systems. Um, so if we could go to the next slide again. So those people who are in apartments or doing some sort of small scale composting, you could look into Bokashi. Bokashi is a Japanese word. Don't know what it means. I'm not even going to pretend like I remember because <laughs> I don't. But uh, with Bokashi, you purchase a product. It's a, an inoculated substrate that you put into a bucket system. So it's two buckets. One of them has holes in the bottom and the other one acts like a receptacle to um, a, a hold on to the liquid that comes off. So it's a fermenting system. You put a lid on the top you put your, your food and paper waste in there and the microbes that have been inoculated into that substrate break down the food. It creates a liquid and that liquid can be used on your house plants. You could spray it outside your apartment if you wanted to. And then you are also left with a solid residue, um, a crumbly composty type of residue. And you could do some guerrilla gardening. Um, uh, the, you know, guerrilla gardening is kind of to do it on the sly. Um, so if you live in an apartment, you probably have some sort of bushes or uh, you know, something around you that you could put that, do that guerrilla gardening and hide the food and paper waste that's been composted. It should have no smell. Uh, it shouldn't even be noticeable. So you can put that under the bushes at your, at your apartment building. Vermicomposting is another form of small scale composting that uses red wiggler worms. Verma in German means worm. So you're composting with worms, and this is a single bin system. You can go to a thrift store and buy a bin with a lid. Um, there's lots of instructions online for how to uh, drill aeration holes into it, the quantity of food waste to dry waste. So this is measuring um, your nitrogen versus your carbons. Um, typically, you do want to put for every volume of nitrogen, you want 20 to 30 volumes of carbon. So that's just a bunch of shredded newspaper, your old mail, um, toilet paper tubes, things like that. Um, again, this could be a whole workshop just on vermicomposting. Another option for those living in an apartment is blender composting. And as we're going through these, um, this graphic here, the ones that have an asterisk by it are the ones that I've personally tried. So blender has a asterisk by it because that was the very first way that I tried composting. We were living in a condo. Uh, it was me and my four kids. Um, and I had a bowl that I kept under the sink and the blender was on top of the counter. And when I got enough in the bowl, I would put everything into the blender, add some water into it. Now you do have to be a little bit careful. Like you can't put raw carrots in there. It's, everything that you put in there should be fairly soft so that the blender can create a slushy of sorts. Um, so think about like you wouldn't want to put chicken bones in there. You wouldn't want to put um, raw food that might be difficult for the blender to chop up. But you could take this, make your slushy, and again, do some guerrilla gardening and put this around the plants at your apartment building. Um, I worked with one gentleman and behind his apartment building was some woods. So he would make his blender slushy 
and go out in the backyard and fling it into the woods. And he just thought that was great that he could be returning those nutrients back to the soil. It was not going to attract rodents or critters because most of the food is already somewhat decomposed. Um, and when you're make, you know, turning it into the slushy, it's really difficult for any of the animals to even find it. So it's going to be, it's not going to attract vermin um, like some people might think that it would. So small scale apartment composting systems. Um, if we could go to the next slide, we will look at some backyard or home scale composting systems. Now hot and cold composting um, refers to whether or not you're turning the pile. Now you do not need to turn a compost pile. It will decompose on its own just fine. Nature will take care of it. Um, we need nature more than nature needs us and nature has her own systems for taking waste and turning it back into soil and returning those nutrients. Um, but if you want your compost finished faster, you would want to do a hot composting system. And I have tried to do that. For me though, it's too difficult. Like I just don't have the time. Um, I'm only 5'2". I don't have a lot of upper body strength. So for me, turning over a huge pile of compost is really difficult. So rather than doing hot composting, I've switched to cold composting. Now it does take longer. Um, I leave my compost for a year just because, you know, I, I don't have time to harvest it all the time. Plus, I'm, I do tend to work on a larger scale. I am working with those organizations and businesses like you saw earlier. So the composting is a slower process. And for me, that's okay. Um, you know, that it just works well for me. So everyone's going to have to decide what works well for, for themselves. The second uh, option in this list is plastic bins or even using pallets. And I'll show you my system in a couple of slides here. And it's a bunch of pallets that I have vertical and it's against my chain link fence. Um, I have also done a plastic bin. So it's just a rectangular upright bin, <clears throat> pardon me, that everything goes in the top. And supposedly you should open this little door at the bottom and be able to scoop everything out. Uh, I just found that that didn't really work like the pictures said that it would. So <laughs> when you're looking at different systems, um, you know, definitely look at reviews because uh, the pressure from the compost or the food and paper waste at the top makes it really difficult to like scoop underneath and have the, the finished compost uh, pull out like the pictures show. So pallets are the things that I'm working with right now. I can fill up, a, a, I call it a bay. Um, kind of like at your, um, uh, like a car mechanic place, they have various bays for the cars to go in. So I've got five bays and I will let one bay finish while I'm filling up the next bay. And then I'll let that one finish. I'll fill up the next bay. So pallets have worked for me, but that's because I'm, I am working on a larger scale. Um, tumbler is another option for many people. Uh, this also could be for apartment composting as well. So if your landlord or landlady allows you to keep a compost tumbler in the backyard, it's a great option. Uh, you do have to make sure that it is getting tumbled. This is a form of hot composting. So you're, you're turning this and this, um, you do need to make sure that you're keeping a fair amount of moisture in there, but not so much that it turns into slime. Um, so this does require a, a bit of attention. Um, in situ is just a fancy phrase in Latin meaning in place. So you could, if you have garden beds, um, take your compost, your food, I'm sorry, your food and paper waste, put it underneath your bushes, put it in underneath your tomatoes, put some straw back on top of it, and just let it compost in place. It's super simple. Like I said, there's enough microbes in the air and in the soil and on the food products themselves that it will decompose. Pit or trench composting uh, is literally just digging a pit. Uh, trench is just a long pit. So you're digging a pit maybe about a foot deep, putting your compost in there and then recovering it with the soil that you took out to dig the pit and then leaving it. So the worms, the roly polies, all the microbes in the soil, they will find their way into the compost. They will eat it all up. And then as it de decomposes, the top of the pile will shrink and your uh, top layer of soil should be uh, eventually become even with the soil that was around it. Same with the trench uh, composting as well. Um, 
So if we could go on to the next slide. Large scale composting. If you've ever gone to a compost site, uh, you've seen the windrows that are there. Maybe they have biodigesters. So a biodigester is a closed system. Um, there's actually a really huge one in Dollywood, which is in Kentucky or Tennessee. And the entire community's waste, all their food and paper products and all the garbage goes into a biodigester. And the microbes and enzymes that they put in there decompose all the food. Some of it is uh, excreted by the microbes and becomes methane. And we know that methane is one of the greenhouse gases that many landfills are notorious for creating. Cows also create methane. So we know that that sulfur smell is not pleasant. But they can take this methane and use it for fuel. So they can use it to create heat. They can create hot water from it. Then the rest of the mass that is left after the methane has been extracted can be used as typical compost. So large scale communities can use biodigesters. There's a lot of money and resources that have to go into that. So it's not very common and not many places are doing that. Compost tea or compost extract is very simple. And this is actually something that people in an apartment or a backyard or home scale composting could do. Um, the compost tea is really similar to what you get when you do bokashi. Um, but if you're doing a home scale, um, like I've got several fruit trees in my backyard and I take a small portion of compost, I mix it in water, I uh, strain off all the solids, and then I can put that compost tea on my plants and I'm putting those nutrients directly in the soil. Um, you can also use this to spray the leaves of the fruit tree and that will help to keep uh, scale and fungal uh, infections off of your tree as well. Um, windrows, again, another large uh, scale possibility. It's typically what's used. A windrow is a long above ground pile and it could be like 50 yards long and special machines are required to churn the pile and mix in enzymes. Um, so if you've ever gone to a compost site, you may have seen windrows. Next slide, please. And then the two other types of composting um, are biochar, which was, is actually a very ancient technique for um, creating enriched soil. Um, it, it comes from uh, Aztec and Mayan cultures where they would burn the forest or burn branches to create charcoal. Now the charcoal was then infused with microbes and turned back into the soil. And so this is another really great way that we can take a waste product. If you've got branches in your yard and want to get rid of them, you could create biochar. Uh, humanure uh, is probably not most people's favorite topics, but it is a way to take our human waste, our human manure. This is also uh, a blending of the two words, human and manure, and using that in our gardens as well. So you can collect urine and then dilute it uh, one part urine to 10 parts water and use that to add nitrogen and other nutrients into the soil directly. So um, I'll do this and I'll sprinkle it on the soil around my tomato plants, my pepper plants, anything that's a really heavy feeder. So anything that's absorbing a lot of nitrogen from the soil, like corn, potatoes, eggplant, peppers, tomatoes, they love this nitrogen rich um, amendment to the soil. And there's a really great book called The Humanure Handbook by Joseph Jenkins, um, if you're interested in learning more about that. So if you go to the next slide, you will get to see my five bay compost system. Now, one of the bays has recently been emptied. So in the center bay, you can see it's currently holding my wheelbarrow. <laughs> so I've taken all the compost out of that. That has gone into my raised beds. And the compost bin to the right of the wheelbarrow is finished. I'm gonna pull that front pallet off and have already started harvesting. Um, this picture was taken back in March, so it's already a bit outdated. So that uh, bin to that bay to the right, that front pallet has been removed. I've already been harvesting compost out of it. The bin to the right of that, so the one on the far right, is finishing off. I've put a layer of brown material on top. It's actually already gone down from, its, from the height that you see in that photograph. Um, it's already gone down to about half the height of the pallet. 
So as food is decomposing, the air pockets get smaller and smaller. Um, some of it is actually lost into the soil and that's okay. For me, the main thing is that I'm preventing food and paper waste from ending up in a landfill. So if it ends up in the, the soil, that's fabulous. It's feeding the trees, it's feeding the microbes. Um, but most of the solid matter is gonna end up in my, in my, raised, in my garden beds. So if we go over to the one that's other way on the left, that one was finished um, last year. I'm gonna let it sit and wait a second year just because I don't need it right now. And also when you're doing humanure composting, you wanna wait at least a minimum of one year. At one year, it is perfectly safe, but I do like to give it an extra year just to be cautious. Now the bin that's um, to the left of the wheelbarrow, you can actually see food on the top there. There's lettuces, tomatoes, my son works at a bakery, so he often brings home bins of stale donuts, much to my mother's chagrin. She would rather eat them, but <laughs> there's only so many donuts one person can eat. So much of, most of that goes into the compost bin. Every autumn, I salvage bags of leaves from the side of the road, so that gets added in as layers of brown material. But you can use anything, like your pasta boxes, cereal boxes, old newspapers, um, cotton balls, Q-tips, all sorts of really cool things can be composted. What can be composted? My main mantra when it comes to composting is that if it comes from the earth, it must go back to the earth. Now, you know, we humans may not be around to see everything going back into the earth, but if we can take care of it now, I feel like we ought to. Like this is our responsibility to take care of our own waste. So if it comes from the earth, it should go back to the earth. Now there are a couple of things that should not end up in your compost bin. So if we can go to the next slide. Three things, that's it. Only three things should not end up in your compost bin. Plastic, metal, and glass. Now biodegradable plastic. Oh, I could do a whole session on biodegradable plastic. But um, most of it is not biodegradable in your backyard compost bin. Many products will say they're biodegradable or they're compostable. And then there's a little asterisk after it. And then if you look at the fine print, maybe on the back of the box or wherever, it'll say in approved facilities. I have not found an approved facility in Northwest Indiana. And I think the Dollywood one is probably the only one that may be able to do it. So what you're looking for with these biodegradable plastics are, is a, a facility that is BPI certified. I wish I could remember what BPI meant, but bioplastics, something or other. <laughs> but uh, BPI certification um, means that it has been shown to decompose in a specified facility. Now, most of our backyard compost bins or piles don't get to the proper temperature for those plant-based plastics to decompose. So plastic should not end up in your compost bin, even if it says it's compostable. Um, and I'll get to that in the third rule in just a second here. But second thing, metal. Metal is not going to decompose unless it's iron. Um, but that takes so long that it's really not worth it. Um, I do put metal in my fire pit, but not everyone has access to a, a fire pit or can even burn in their communities. But fire is a form of oxidization. And we all know how things rust. That's oxidization. It's turning the metal product that we humans have made back into iron oxide. And iron is a very important nutrient for many of the, the garden crops that we like to grow. Um, but for the most part, you do not want to put metal into your compost bin. And then obviously, no glass. It's not going to decompose. Um, this is kind of important, though. Uh, if you are sweeping your floor, typically you can take your floor sweepings and put them into the compost. Because like at my house, I've got dogs. So there's dog hair. There's food products. There's, you know, little tidbits of papers and stuff because my kids are messy. Kids are messy. Um, so I'll take the sweepings and put them into the compost. But if you have broken a glass recently, I would highly recommend not putting that, um, that, those floor sweeping sinks. You don't want to have broken glass in your compost. So when I was talking about not putting plastics in or not putting compostable plastics in, if you're not sure, experiment. Consider it something fun to keep an eye on and to you know, maybe make a discovery about. Maybe you'll find that a compostable straw really is decomposing. Um, much to your amazement after I've just told you that it's not going to, but it's very possible that it might. 
So think of it as an experiment. Don't think you're going to mess up because you can't. Um, if you end up with a compost that's either really dry and crumbly, that's okay. If it ends up really being thick and wet, that's okay too. It's just different amounts of carbon or nitrogen that are in your compost. You cannot kill your compost. I've had many people ask, Christine, what do I do? I killed my compost. I'm like, no, you didn't. If it's just really thick and wet, there's a lot of nitrogen in it and you can put it back into your compost and add more brown material and that will quote unquote fix it. Same with the, if it's really light and fluffy and um, you feel like it ought to be heavier or if it's just really crumbly, put more food products in there. And then as it decomposes, you'll end up with what you see in social media as being like perfect compost, even though there really is no such thing. Now, if you're looking or listening, this is my crazy compost compilation. There are different areas of the house or the office or different areas of life that over time, I have thought, hmm, I need to put a list together so people realize that this thing that I've discovered can be composted, that they'll realize um, that it can be. So there's a list from the kitchen. There's a list of items from the bathroom, um, party and holiday supplies, um, things from the house, from the office, and pet related. I've got a list of resources. You can go to this resources page and see the, the various um, books and websites and YouTube videos that I would recommend if you want to learn more about compost. So the Permaculture Research Institute has a great uh, website. And if they have a search function on there, you can type in the word compost and it'll bring up articles that they've posted. Yes Magazine is my absolute favorite magazine. If you need some positive stories, positive journalism in your life, um, yes, magazine is it. Um, for my birthday last year, you know, on Facebook, you can do a fundraiser. This was my fundraiser. I, like I wanted people to donate to Yes Magazine because I am so passionate about their their writing and their journalists. Um, they cover everything permaculture related, even though they don't call it permaculture, but they do social justice. They do earth care, they do future care. So they're hitting all three of those permaculture ethics um, without saying that it's permaculture, but they have a specific issue. I wanna say it was from 2019 and it's specifically about dirt. Um, and I, I have a little issue with the word dirt because <laughs> dirt is something you get on your hands that you don't want there, or it's you know the dust that gets on your counters that you don't want there. Soil, on the other hand, is rich with life. So. I think they should have titled it soil, but that's not as nearly as interesting. So they called it dirt. Um, I know you can get that back issue if you want to. Uh, the Permaculture Institute of Great, uh, Permaculture Institute of North America, also called PINA, um, is where I received my permaculture certifications through. So if you are at all interested in learning more about permaculture, this is the organization for North America. There is uh, an international permaculture institute as well. And you can go to convergences and classes all over the world. There's so much going on to learn about permaculture. Um, the local organization though for Pina is called Great Rivers and Lakes Permaculture. So if you want to Google Great Rivers and Lakes Permaculture Institute, you can find out what's going on in the Midwest region. Midwest Permaculture is an organization out of Stell, Illinois, and they do permaculture design courses once or twice a year, I believe. Um, lots of really great workshops. Um, and then I personally host the Northwest Indiana Permaculture Meetup Group, as well as the Facebook paging group. So if you're interested in finding out what's going on in Northwest Indiana, and when we host workshops, they will get posted there. So you're welcome to join us. We do lots of different topics, um, water catchment, how to make a clay oven, um, wild edibles, um, trying to remember some of the other workshops that we've has, hosted. Um, we have been taking a hiatus because of COVID. We have not been doing um, any personal workshops and um, hopefully we'll be able to start that back up sometime in the future because I love getting to meet people and increasing my tribe. Um, some of the people that I would recommend researching, looking into, Dr. Elaine Ingham again, she's that microbiologist that I mentioned earlier. Um, she's still doing lots of workshops. Granted, some of them are a little bit pricey, but um, if you're interested more in soil health, phenomenal workshops. Um, Mark Shepard is out of Wisconsin. 
and he has a 300 acre farm that he has been implementing permaculture principles and techniques on and has restored these 300 acres so that they are regenerate. So he's regenerating the soil, um, but he's also using long-term perennial plants in his, on his 300 acres. John Kemp, um, also uh, very much into microbiology and soil health. He's got some really great um, YouTube videos that you can listen to. Now he's Amish. Um, he finished eighth grade, which is typical for most Amish boys, and was so fascinated with the sciences that he taught himself biology, microbiology, chemistry, organic chemistry. Um, so he is self-taught. He's very passionate about what he has learned and loves sharing it, but you will never see his face. Um, but his workshops are phenomenal. Uh, many of you have probably already heard of Joel Salatin of Polyface Farms out of, I believe, Virginia. Um, again, more great videos and books to read about. And then the book that I mentioned earlier by Joseph Jenkins about the Humanure Handbook. So we will take a quick five minute break. When you come back, there will be another poll. And it's a fun questionnaire that uh, was developed by Cornell University. All right, so everyone got question one correct. False, composting requires a lot of time and expensive equipment. Absolutely not. Unless you are a municipality and you need all sorts of trucks and tractors and churners and enzymes and stuff, you don't need anything to compost. You can take the food straight from your kitchen and throw it out in the garden and it will decompose. So great, glad to see everybody got 100% on that. Second question, yard waste such as leaves or grass clippings make up a relatively small portion of total garbage from a typical household and don't need to be considered for composting. Yeah, that's 100% false. Actually, food and paper waste and yard waste can make up to 40% of what ends up in our landfills. And um, they shouldn't. They should end up uh, back in the soil as a nutrient amender to uh, our gardens and to the food that we're eating. So yes, 100% false on that one. Um, moisture is necessary for a composting process to occur, occur. Very true. Microbes and fungi need moisture. They cannot survive without it, just like us. So they, it, you do need some moisture content when you're composting. Um, if you're doing an above ground or something that is on the soil itself, whether it's pit or trench composting or hot or cold composting, or if your uh, bin is directly on the soil, any extra moisture will percolate through. And unless you're in a drought, unless there's a drought and um, it gets really, really dry, um, then you might need to add some water to it. But for the most part, you shouldn't have to water your compost whatsoever. If you've got a closed system though, like a tumbler or vermicomposting, you need to pay a little bit of attention to that. But for the most part, um, most compost uh, does need some moisture, but doesn't need a whole lot of tending. Um, question number four, disposal of solid waste is a problem that should be dealt with only through municipal government action. We had some mixed results on that. Um, I don't think that it only needs to be dealt with through the municipal government. Um, we as individuals can be very proactive in taking care of some of our own waste. Um, so we definitely can be helping with that. It does not need to just be a government uh, problem or uh, solution. Number five, if you're throwing away grass clippings, you are throwing away money. That is very true. So um, the grass clippings are high in nitrogen. And um, if you are um, raking up those grass clippings and putting them in a bag, first of all, you're paying for that bag. So you're throwing away money by paying for that bag. If you are then having that hauled away by a waste hauler, there's all the petroleum that goes into the, the trucks, as well as the oil that's used for getting it to the, comp, the, uh, the landfill site. So yes, we are literally throwing away money if you're throwing away your, your grass clippings. They're an excellent resource. Um, more than anything, you should just be grass mulching, which means cutting it and letting it um, drop back onto the soil for natural composting. If you live in an area where there's a homeowners association and you cannot leave them on the soil or on top of the lawn, you can rake them up. If they're fresh, you do want to put them in a, 
uh, you want to make sure that there's enough brown material, so enough newspaper, cardboard, leaf, dry leaves, um, to help balance all of that nitrogen. So again, we're looking for that balance of carbon and nitrogen. Um, for every portion of nitrogen, you need to have 20 to 30 portions of carbon to get that good balance. Um, question number six, to be in a composter, you need to live out in the country or at least in an area with plenty of yard space. And so Victoria, you were talking about your Bokashi um, in the chat, or no, you, in person you were talking about your Bokashi. Um, and so like everybody can compost. You do not need to live in an area that even has a yard. You can do this in a highly dense urban area. Question number seven, all kitchen scraps and garbage should be included in home or school compost systems. This is a question where I would say it depends. So if you're doing vermicomposting or bokashi composting, you may not be able to add meat or dairy or fats to it because worms can't eat those things as easily and they're more likely to go rancid and get really smelly in such a closed environment. But in an open compost system, like a hot or cold system, like the picture I showed you that I have in my backyard, where it's open to oxygen, I compost everything. So um, like my three rules, the first rule is if it comes from the earth, it should go back to the earth. So meat products, dairy products, oils and fats, those are all earth products. So they should go back to the earth in the composting system. But it depends on how you're composting. And if you cannot compost, meat or dairy or oils, then it may just end up in a landfill. And, you know, we just do the best that we can with the resources that we have available. Um, but for most home or school compost systems, nearly everything can and should be composted. So question number eight. I, I like this question because this one is, um, uh, my answer is going to go against what pretty much every other composter would say. And so the question is, diseased vegetable and flower plants should not be composted in a typical home or school system. And according to Cornell, you should not. You shouldn't compost diseased vegetable or, or flower plants. But thinking back to that soil food web that I showed you earlier by Dr. Elaine Ingham, if you have diseased vegetable or flower plants, typically what's happening is that your soil is not nutrient dense. The plants are not getting the nutrients they need from the soil because the microbes and the fungi can't perform their function in the soil because they don't get the nutrients that they need. So everything being connected, if your vegetables or your flowers are diseased, it's not their fault. It's the fault of the soil. So when we add our compost back to the soil, our plants will be healthier, the products that they're creating for us, whether it's cut flowers or zucchini or tomatoes, they will all be healthier. And your plants will be able to resist insect infestation and diseases because they are getting what they need from the soil and we won't have pest problems anymore when we have healthy plants. So if you're able to watch the John Kemp videos and he talks about how we can remove all of these supposed pest problems simply by enriching the soil with compost. So if you have diseased vegetables or flower parts, they can be composted and they should be um, because they're very specific to that unhealthy plant. So here's a perfect example. In my backyard, I have very clay soil. It's super, super dense, very heavy, not very nutrient rich because the main area where I've been gardening um, back before I bought my house 15, 20 years ago was a pool. So there's, I'm sure, residual chemicals in there, and there's lots of rocks in there, so it's not a very rich uh, soil. Um, I've had zucchini plants growing in my soil, and they get attacked by the vine borer. 20 feet away, where I have my raised garden beds, my raised garden beds are filled with only compost. So I'll take the compost from my, my, bed, my garden bins here, put them into my raised beds, 20 feet apart, I've got two zucchini plants. One is being attacked by the vine borer. The other one is perfectly healthy with absolutely nothing attacking it. Now, the only thing that could be different is the soil that they're growing in and the fact that the plant itself is healthy. When plants are healthy, they can resist insects. And actually, when a plant is unhealthy, it sends out a pheromone 
kind of like when we humans are scared or we're unhealthy, we send out pheromones. Um, so plants will send out a pheromone that indicates that they're not healthy and that will attract insects to the plant. And that's what happens. So a diseased vegetable or plant is a direct indication of the soil quality. So yes, they can be composted. Question number nine. A tightly closed bin or enclosure is necessary for the production of good compost. Yay that everybody got that one correct because you absolutely do not want to have a tightly closed bin or enclosure because that would create an anaerobic system. And we do not want to create an anaerobic system because that gets stinky and smelly and slimy and gross. So we do want to make sure that there's plenty of oxygen getting through there, that there's nice air pockets if you're doing a bin or a tumbler or um, uh, a vermicompost bin, you want to make sure that there's air pockets, that there's drainage holes. Um, you saw my pallets. My pallets have lots of air pockets in them. I do line them with chicken wire or hardware cloth. That helps to keep everything confined into the bin. These aren't falling out, but um, also provides lots of aeration. And then the last question, number 10. For the composting process to occur mo most efficiently, Special microorganisms, hormones, and activators need to be added to the compost. This is another question where the correct answer is, it depends. And I know you didn't have that option, so it was kind of a trick question. Um, if you are doing bokashi or vermicomposting, or if you are a municipality that is doing windrows, then yes, you probably do need to add some sort of activator or enzyme. Um, or worms. Uh, if you're doing vermicomposting, you need to add the red wigglers. Um, other types of composting, nearly every other type of composting does not need the addition of hormones, organisms, or activators of any sort. So that's kind of a trick question. Um, but that was really fun to go through. And I would like to open it up to have some conversation. We've got about 25 minutes or so, 28 minutes. So um, Amanda and Leslie, what sort of questions have come up in the chat that we can discuss? So Latrice asks, how do you compost in the winter? So again, the answer is going to be it depends. It really depends on what sort of system that you're using. Um, but for nearly every type of composting, you can continue adding food and paper waste to your pile, to your tumbler, to your bins. Um, if you've got pits or trenches and you live in the Midwest, Composting in the winter or digging those trenches is probably going to be very difficult because the soil freezes so solidly. But what happens in the winter is that the micro, um, uh, the insects and everything, they will retreat in the soil. They're going to go somewhere warmer where they can survive the winter. And then when it starts to warm up again, they will come back up into the pile, start to eat all their way through the food and paper waste that you've been putting in that pile. Now your pile will get pretty tall. Uh, mine has gotten to the tops of my pallets in the winter, sometimes even mounded above the tops of the edges in the winter time. Um, and that's why I have multiple piles. But as soon as spring hits and everything starts to fall, that pile will gently start to shrink down and then come uh, to the top of the compost pile or the edges again. Um, so you can continue composting in the winter. If you have a vermicompost bin, you do want to make sure they stay somewhere slightly warm. So you don't want them to get less than like 60 degrees or so because then they'll become less active. So if you are doing vermicomposting, you want to try to keep that bin either on an enclosed heated porch or if you can at a closet in the house somewhere. Um, but you do want to keep those worms warm so that they keep eating. Otherwise, the food that you're putting in there will putrefy before they get a chance to eat it because they're just too cold. They can't function that way. Okay, it looks like John has a question. He'd like to know where the microbes come from. Oh gosh, microbes are everywhere. Um, you know, they are on our skin. They are floating around in the air. They're on the food that you eat. Um, when you put leftovers into the refrigerator, you know, if you leave them for two or three weeks, You'll get fungus growing, you'll get mold growing. The microbes are everywhere and they're ready to start decomposing anything that you give them an opportunity to start to decompose. So microbes are everywhere. We cannot Lysol them away. They will, we can't bleach the entire world. Um, microbes and fungi and um, you know, they're everywhere. And that's 
one of the great things about them is that we don't need to introduce them into our composting systems. Um, no matter what sort of type so soil you have, they will more than likely find your compost because they are more than happy to eat it. Okay, Latrice points out that red wigglers are not native to the area. If we use them for composting and then release them into the environment, could it have consequences? That's a really good point, Latrice. Uh, no worm, I think North America only has one native worm. All the other worms, like garden worms that we consider to be so healthy for our soil, as well as red wigglers, are invasive. Um, I work for Shirley Hines Land Trust and we deal with a lot of invasive species, whether it's um, in Asian carp or uh, Oriental bittersweet, um, and even these worms. Uh, there's a new worm that's been introduced. It's called the Japanese jumping worm or Chinese jumping worm. It comes from Asia. Um, and you're right, they are invasive. They are not native to this area. Red wigglers and earthworms are just going to become part of the continent and everyday life here. There's not really much we can do about that. Um, you do not need to include them in your composting. So unless you're doing indoor vermicomposting, you don't need to even add red wigglers. You can let the insects, the microbes, the fungi decompose everything. Um, and so you don't, you, don't, you don't even need to use them if you don't want to. So if you don't have them, I would suggest not introducing them. I unfortunately, 15 years ago when I moved to this house here, I did get red wigglers because I was under the assumption, you know, having read all of the composting books that I had, that you had to have red wigglers. So I did introduce them. I don't see them being a problem. Um, but I'm also not fully aware of how they might affect areas outside of my garden. John's curious if you have any additional information on the jumping worms and why they're called jumping worms. <laughs> they are called jumping worms because they are incredibly wiggly. Um, they don't actually jump out of the soil, but if you were to um, dig them up out of the soil, one of their defense mechanisms is to squirm really, really quickly. And that kind of scares any potential predators. So a, a bird that might come across this jumping worm would be startled and not try to eat it. So that's its defense mechanism. That's, what it's, that's why it's got the name, the jumping worm. But it doesn't actually jump out of the soil. It doesn't bite humans. Um, it's not a, a problem for us at all. It was introduced on some plants that came from Asia. And just like everything else that gets spread around the world because of our global economy, um, this particular critter uh, is just known, if you go to a, a nursery and you happen to get a plant that has the eggs in it and you plant that in your garden, you're gonna end up with a, a bunch of, worm, of these jumping worms. And at that point, it's kind of like the red wigglers and the earthworms, we're, there's not much we can do about it. Um, one potential, option for helping to minimize the impact of them is to get chickens. Chickens eat worms. If you're digging in your garden and you come across them, the chickens will eat them. Um, but other than that, there's really no other way to control these jumping worms except just to recognize that they're going to become part of everyday life. Okay, Latrice has a comment. She's okay. read or heard that you are not to include drier lint in your composting due to the synthetic fibers. What are your thoughts on this? Very true. So many of the clothing products that we put through our washer and our dryer do have uh, little tidbits of plastic in them. So what I've done is I will put my dryer lint into the compost and the natural fibers, so anything that's made of cotton or wool, those fibers will be eaten. And what you're left with after you're, you know, when you're harvesting your compost, you'll find this little white fluff ball of plastic threads. Um, it kind of looks like the inside of a pillow stuffing. So I take that little section of what looks like pillow stuffing and I put that into my fire pit um, and it gets burned up. Um, it's such a small amount that I'm not worried about pollution. Um, you know, and I'm, and I'm not creating huge fires of burning plastic or billowing black smoke or anything. Um, it's such a small amount that I'm not super worried about it. Um, another reason I'm not worried about burning that small amount from the dryer lint is that petroleum is actually the product of decomposed plant and animal materials. 
So I am actually taking a product and turning it back into soil, which is going to create more plants and animals. So when you think about what petroleum is and where it comes from, we're actually taking an earth material, like nothing is coming from Mars or Venus or anywhere else. Everything that we humans use comes from this earth. Now it's just a matter of how long it's gonna stay around, like uh, styrofoam. Styrofoam is gonna be here for a very long time. Um, although I have recently done an experiment with superworms, which are a type, it's a larva of the uh, darkling beetle. Now this darkling beetle's larva will eat styrofoam and create a type of compost. So there is hope for styrofoam as far as decomposing it and getting it back into the natural cycle of things, but um, that would be like a whole nother conversation. So you can actually Google um, composting with composting styrofoam with superworms and you'll you'll see articles done by universities where they're actually experimenting with uh, taking styrofoam and then turning it back into compost so it's it's mind-blowing it it gives me such hope latrice also mentions uh receipts the ink that is used on the receipts is toxic and is that something that needs to be considered uh for compost because it's in such small amounts, like unless you are putting 100 receipts into your compost every day, it's such a small amount. And I don't think we give microbes enough credit for decomposing what we perceive to be a toxic material. Um, there's a great guy, his name is Paul Stamets, and he's been doing a lot of research with fungi and how the mycelium, which are the little roots of the fungus, can actually decompose toxic chemicals. So if you want to research Paul Stamets, uh, his last name is S-T-A-M-E-T-S. -E He's done a lot of research with mushrooms um, and how they can clean our uh, toxically, um, our toxic soils. Sure, uh, Latrice, his last name is S-T-A-M-E-T-S. Paul Stamets. He's got YouTube videos, he's got a website, he sells um, products. You can actually purchase, um, you're welcome. <laughs> you can purchase uh, um, spores from him. So if you wanna grow your own mushrooms in your house, you can. Um, but my main interest is the fact that he's done experiments with um, toxic chemicals in soil. So he'll have three piles. And in the first pile, it's his control pile. It's got all the toxic chemicals and nothing is added to it. They put a tarp over the top of it. On the second pile is that same toxic soil. Um, and then they add, oh gosh, I forget what they add to it. Um, they add some sort of like chemical cleaner or whatever. And then they put a tarp over that. And then on the third pile is that same co um, chemically laden soil and then they put mycelium in it. Again, mycelium is the roots of the fungus, the mushrooms. Then they put a tarp over there. They wait for three weeks. And this is, this is an experiment he did like on a professional level. After three weeks, they took the tarps off of all three of them. The control pile was the same. The toxic chemicals were still there at the same levels. Absolutely no changes had been made. In the second pile, the chemical cleaners, or I, I wish I could remember what was being used, but in that second pile, there was moderate change, but still it was just slimy, gross, yucky stuff that had not improved at all. Then of course in the third pile, uh, save the best for last, the mycelium have decomposed all of the toxic chemicals. There are these beautiful mushrooms growing out of it. They have purified the soil. And to, again, this, this again gives me great hope that microbes and insects and fungi are going to be just fine. Um, once we humans are gone. <laughs> that, um, you know, we need the earth more than the earth needs us. And because we need her more, we need to be treating her better. And we need to be doing more to, um, you know, taking care of what we perceive to be a waste product, because it's not. We just need to find the right creature that's going to decompose it and, and put it back into that cycle of life. Ow, I'm sorry. Oh, there. I yeah. see it now. Uh, John was asking if there are any other critters that could help the garden thrive. All of them. 
Um, you know, roly polies are really wonderful. Um, they're in the family isopod. So anything from the isopod family, they're the ones that uh, curl up into a little ball when they get scared. But their cousins are the ones that stay flat. They kind of look like a, um, like a little mini lobster. Uh, they've got like scales on their back. Um, they're related. Um, those are really great. They help to decompose wood particles or um, the brown material in your garden. But pretty much just letting things come up from the soil or letting them fly in. Oh gosh, it was so funny. I had somebody ask me one time, she's like, Christine, there's all these maggots in my compost. Why do I have these here? I'm like, you want them. They're decomposing your food. If you don't want them, you need to put another layer of brown material on top and that will help to prevent the, the female flies from laying their eggs in the first place because they'll have a harder time finding it. But if you just have open exposed food, yes, of course, flies are gonna come in and start to eat the, the, the food product and lay their eggs in it because that's a perfect substrate for their larva to live. Um, there is actually a type of composting that's done with soldier flies. Now, soldier flies are bigger than a house fly and their larvae are larger. You could actually take those larvae and give them to your chickens if you had them in, in a backyard. Uh, but soldier flies are actually encouraged in composting. Um, I personally don't know how to attract them just because I constantly have mine covered as much as possible. Um, but they'll, they'll just come. So John, there's really nothing you need to do. There's nothing you need to add. The microbes are there, the insects are there what is meant to be their will. It will help to decompose our waste product and turn it back into soil, which is just one of the marvelous things about nature. Okay, Latrice makes a comment. She says, yesterday I had a watermelon in my compost pile. I do cold composting and I saw a raccoon, which scared me, so I removed it. Do I need to be concerned with animals? If you are concerned with animals, and uh, Latrice, I'm actually not too far away from you. I'm in South Haven, which is between Portage and Valpo. Um, and raccoons are everywhere. Um, critters can scare us, um, especially raccoons, because they can be um, a bit ferocious. They can, um, you know, attack without warning sometimes. Um, I have had raccoons prowling around my backyard. I've had opossums. I actually really like possums because they help to eat ticks and they're great. Raccoons, on the other hand, are a little bit scarier. Um, you can put the watermelon back in your compost. If anything, you might need to cover it with several layers of brown material, or if in your backyard, you can do pit composting or trench composting, or even try blender composting. Um, then there won't be anything for the raccoon to grab and eat and take away. It'll just be smells and eventually they'll go away. That once they realize that there's no continual food source there, they won't keep coming back. Christine, I'm curious, are there any uh, myths that you would like to um, clarify? I know you said sometimes people are concerned about smell and different things with their composting. Is there anything that you come across as far as questions or myths that you want to clarify for the group? Well, you bring up the, co the comment about smells and typically if you're getting smells from your compost, it's that you're not adding enough brown material. So, um, you know, when we're talking about the brown material, those are your carbs heavy products. So um, that would be adding newspaper or toilet paper tubes or shredded mail, as long as it's not the little plastic windows, um, you know, pizza boxes, cereal boxes. Um, it's amazing if you look in your recycle bin, you probably have a lot of brown material that you could be adding to your compost that will help to mitigate the smells. So smells are an indicator. It doesn't mean that you're failing. It doesn't mean that you're killing your compost. It just means that you need to balance it a little bit better by adding more brown material to it. And there's plenty of brown material around us. It's amazing how much we recycle brown material when it really could be composted instead. Um, I think the other myth that I often hear is that I've killed my compost. And I think I mentioned this earlier, and you, you cannot kill compost. Um, it's just that it turned out differently than you were hoping for. I mean, we see pictures on social media and websites where somebody's holding holding out this beautiful handful of black crumbly compost. And mine doesn't look like that. I don't think I've ever had my compost turn out like it does in a picture. Um, you know, mine has eggshells in it and it has pieces of cardboard that haven't fully composted. Or sometimes it is really wet and heavy 
And what that indicates is if there's a lot of nitrogen in there, um, but you cannot kill compost. So I hope that's like the one thing I can leave with everybody is if you are doing something that's better than nothing and more than anything, the main point is to help reduce what's ending up in a landfill unnecessarily and getting those nutrients back into that cycle and enriching our own bodies and the people around us with good, healthy food. Okay, Latrice has a, a question on here about composting versus recycling brown. Which should be our first choice? Composting, always composting. As soon as, okay, so if you put something in your recycle bin, there are times when the products that we put in our recycle bins don't actually make it to a recycle facility. If somebody has put a pizza box with greasy pizza or paper towels with food product on it into their recycle bin, they will completely reject that load. They will say, sorry, we're not, we're not taking these recyclables. So it's very likely that your recyclables are ending up in the garbage anyway. So to prevent that, the best thing is to do is for us to take care of our own waste. So composting should always be our first go-to because we are being responsible for our waste. We're returning those nutrients directly to the soil which will then you know, make more plants, which will enrich the soil, which will, have you noticed that this is very cyclical? <laughs> um, so composting should always be what we opt for first because we cannot completely trust the recycling system. They just don't always have control over what everybody else is putting into them. Um, their quality control agents will reject loads. Those loads will end up in the landfill and then we've lost potential compost. Yeah. She said, oh, wow. So I'm, I'm agreeing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've taught enough composting classes and I've taken the Master Recycler course and um, overall worldwide, only about nine or 10% of products that could be recycled are actually being recycled. So we humans are doing a very poor job of cleaning up after ourselves. And if we can make an effort like composting in our backyard, that's a really wonderful thing that we can do. And it's, it's so empowering too, to know that like I have a choice, I can make this small decision. Um, I don't have any government you know, oversight uh, about what I'm doing. Um, you know, my neighbors all understand what I'm doing. I've actually had neighbors ask me for buckets of compost if I have extra. And if you compost, you know, you never have extra compost. You know, it's, it's, they call it black gold for a reason. It's so valuable. Um, to anybody who gardens that you you never have extra to give away. If you do give it away, it really is, uh, it's a gift of the heart. It's, it's a, a gift of your time and your energy and your passion. Um, so hopefully the person who's on the receiving end of that will, will treasure that as much as you do. Christine, I had a quick question. When you mentioned that you had your bins and you kind of rotate through, how do you know, like what key indicators are you looking for to know that your bin is ready? to then be placed out in your raised beds? Because um, you I mentioned sometimes you wait a year, sometimes you, you wait two years. Yeah, typically one year is a minimum. Um, if you're doing cold composting, it just takes that long for the critters to get all the way through it. Um, like I said, the eggshells don't really decompose very well, but it is an important nutrient to add into it. Um, mostly though, it, I can tell by how much it has shrunk in Pile. So usually it'll go from full to like about halfway, even to about a third or so. Um, so it's, and then like lifting up the top layers, you can tell it's crumbly, it's rich. Um, like I said, I've never had a half of perfect compost. Um, I would really rather add too much brown material and have it kind of dry and crumbly than too thick and nitrogen rich. That doesn't mean it's wrong, but um, usually it's just a matter of time. Like it, it needs to have and especially in the Midwest here, you know, we pretty much only have like April through October when the insects and microbes are active. Other than that, it's too cold. They're, they're receding down. They're hunkering down the same way that we like to in the winter time. Um, and then they become active again in like March or April. So we only have about six or seven months where it's active composting and it does its most work when it's super hot outside. So they're then, um, uh, you know, uh, laying eggs and, and making more and creating. And so there's more insects there to do the job 
So again, then that window shrinks again. So maybe it's like June until September that the pile is actually active. So those other months are pretty lost, which is why it takes a year for everything to be composted in a cold system. If anybody needs to get a hold of me, I am more than happy to answer questions. Pop over Zoom. Um, if you're not too far away, I'm happy to even come and visit. Or if you want me to come and do a group presentation, I am love talking about compost. Um, it is absolutely, I seriously am a lunatic when it comes to composting um, and just, it's my passion. So however I can encourage people, I would love to. Yeah, you're more than welcome to find me on Facebook. It's Christine Maloney. Um, if you want to join the, um, the Northwest Indiana Permaculture Group, you can join the Facebook group. You can also go to meetup.com and find NWI Permaculture. When we start having workshops and get-togethers again, I'll start posting those. I do have a bunch of pictures from our previous workshops that I would love to get posted up there, on there so people can see what we've done. Um, it's a really neat group of like-minded individuals. Like your tribe will expand. It's just wonderful. So feel free to find me on Facebook or uh, join either of those groups. So thank you, everyone. It's been really wonderful. I really wish this was in person, but I'm glad everybody was able to uh, to do this at home from their pajamas.